Blackberry is almost no middle and high frequency noise to weigh about at the intakes of these compressors. That sort of split splitter silence sound again. Good. This often runs people into trouble. my U for Universal mixes, generally useful. You may have some of this later. Okay, coming up. Egypt, lot one. The same sink points as before at 230 feet um, when the uh, sun start to emerge in the pyramid. Like go to these sound generators here, electronic generators, and we'll listen to three of the basic electronic sounds. First, it's the simplest sound of all, which is a sine wave. It is here on the oscilloscope. It has a very simple form and has a very pure sound. I once said the is a bit like a diamond. It depends how you shine the light through it. You get all sorts of different delias. Oh, she was sparkly and, and wonderful, great, terrific fun. Her great joy was sound. She was talking about somebody having a wonderful pair of ears. I mean, they could appreciate sound. She's fascinating because she had all this magic up her sleeve and she was doing it as a regular job. Who was Delia Jarvis for me? I think she was a friend, a very talented composer. Also very curious about other people, but um, a tormented soul, you know, she has, uh, had lots of problems, unfortunately. You know, she was always, you know, calculating stuff and uh, she carried around reams and reams of paper, usually in a large shopping basket with the bottle. <laughs> a more complex sound still is white noise. We call it white because it contains all sound frequencies in the same way as white light contains all frequencies. of Delia Derbyshire, a pioneer of electronic music in Britain and a prime mover in the BBC's radiophonic workshop. She went on to influence many famous musicians and composers around the world, but will probably be best known for TV's most famous theme tune, Doctor Who. It's come to me. It gets relatively recently that, that my, my love for abstract sounds were the sounds of the air raid siren because that's the sound you hear and you don't know the source of it. There's a child. And, and then the sound, the all clear. Well, that, that's the electronic music. Seven feet is the beginning of the dissolve into the tunnel.
just think, D.A. Derbyshire and me, Cosy Fanny Tootie, spending our lives immersed in music and art. I'm so drawn to Delia, there's connections I hadn't expected. It'd be wonderful to leave Delia a note that she could collect, a point of contact across the dimensions. The feel of the place makes me speculate about the possibility of residual sounds being held in the concrete, trace elements of life. Mm. Musique concrète, source from concrète. I wonder how, from what we leave behind, do we expect people to have any understanding of who we really are? or the reasons behind our life choices. Back in the days when that was recorded, it was a completely different process, and that track you've listened to just now was Matashan, put together at the BBC Radiophonic Workshop back in the early 60s by Delia Derbyshire. Sometime since you heard that track, I guess. Yes, since 1968, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm tickled pink by it. <laughs> it's charming, isn't it? I think that uh, what, what you achieved in the Radiophonic Workshop is something that maybe we should define slightly for people listening to the programme who maybe don't realise the processes that actually went into making that kind of music. Freedom of the spirit. The gateway to the next phase of life. A doorway into a new life. I have a very strange mind because I analyse everything, not just music. I'm drawn so deep into Delia's story. It's like a map of her life through sound or a coded message. There are so many subtleties in the human voice. I think I've found the language of a shared experience. Even when I'm listening to the news, I note every inflection, every comma. I suppose, in a way, I was experimenting in psychoacoustics. <laughs> so I, I came from. Uh, well, 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 I think what they'd like to call themselves upper working class <laughs> Catholic background. Catholic, Roman Catholic. In Coventry. I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Don't make me come up those stairs. I won't. How can I make you come up the stairs? The BBC presents Private Dreams and Public Nightmares, a radiophonic poem by Frederick Bradnam. The programme is introduced by the producer, Donald McWinney. This programme is an experiment, an exploration. It's been put together with enormous enthusiasm and equipment designed for other purposes. It's not a masterpiece, not even a minor one, and it's not a stunt. We think it's worth broadcasting as a perfectly serious first attempt to find out whether we can convey a new kind of emotional and intellectual experience by means of what we call radiophonic effects. 
By radiophonic effects, we mean something very near to what the French have labelled musique concrète. The basis of it is an unlimited supply of magnetic tape, recording machine, razor blade, and something to stick the bits together with, and a group of technicians who think nothing is too much trouble provided it works. You take a sound, any sound, record it, and then change its nature, a sort of modern magic. Many of you may be familiar with it. They've been exploiting it on the continent for years. But strangely enough, we've held aloof. Partly for distrust. Is it simply a new toy? Some musicians believe that it can become an art form complete in itself. One thought does occur from time to time, not entirely frivolously. Would it not be more illuminating to play the whole thing backwards? Oh, the radio, the radio, the radio was the most important thing in my life. And music, music, music. I was told in no uncertain terms that the BBC does not employ composers. And so it was only by gradually sort of infiltrating the system that I, I managed to do the, the music. I, I think you'd call that music, wouldn't you? Well, what I'm really interested in is sound. Sound? Yes. Uh, the sound of what? Well, I'm interested in sound. The music and acoustics. I see, Miss Darbish. You'd like to combine your interest in mathematics with your interest in music? Yes. As a career choice? Well, music is just an expression of mathematics. It's an idea that was established way back in the 6th century by Pythagoras. Yes, dear, but this is a career's office, not ancient Greece. Do you see? <laughs> Have you considered a career in deaf aids, Miss Derbyshire? No, Mr Thompson. Have you? Angela! Tea! Christ alive. And you are? Delia. Delia Derbyshire. Mm, where are you from? Coventry. Not much of it left, is there? Well. Totally decimated, wasn't it? Yeah. Cambridge. Oh. Girton. <laughs> good old Girton College. It's rather good, isn't it? Hmm? For girls. I studied music and. Uh... Mathematics, too. Unusual. But do go on. <clears throat> well, my interest is in sound and acoustics. I'm also a musician. I play the piano and the violin, the double bass. And I'd very much like to work as a sound recordist or, well, possibly a music balance. Mm. Ah, yes. I'll have to stop you there, Miss Derbyshire. Decca Records does not employ women in its recording studios or any of its technical departments. Never has, probably never will. I see. Why would that be? Those are the house rules. I'm not paid to question them, Miss Derbyshire, only to observe them. However, we do have posts for women in our administration department and there may well be a secretarial position available at the end of the month. Cheerio! Toodaloo! <laughs> he was probably the man who turned down the Beatles. And this comes back to something else I'd like to stress. You see, there's that sexist thing again. One director came into the workshop and said to me, Oh, you must be an ardent feminist. But I think I was a post-feminist before feminism was even invented. I prefer to describe myself as an individualist. An individualist. An individualist. That's me. Golly, I realise that now. An individualist. An individualist. An individualist. An individualist. An individualist. An individualist. And so I went to Geneva to teach English. 
And that's when I started bombarding the BBC with endless applications. And I finally ended up with a three-month placement as a studio manager. I'm told you have extraordinary powers. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Uh, the fellows on record review are a little in awe. Uh, they tell me you can find a piece of music on an LP just by looking at it. How? Magic. Hmm, yes. Witchcraft was mentioned. I simply hold the disc up to the light and look for where the groove modulations break up the light the most. Trombones and strings are particularly easy to spot. Mr. Harper, could I please have a placement at the Radiophonic Workshop at Maida Vale? Are you mad? No, I'm neither mad nor a witch. I'm just fascinated by what they do in there and I'd like to work with tape manipulation. <sighs> I must warn you, nobody's ever requested to join that department before. People are normally sent there, unwillingly. Like to Coventry, as a punishment. Yes, in some cases. It's, it's, a, it's a very um, particular environment that we're not sure is altogether uh, healthy. <laughs> May I ask you why? I'd like to create sounds that have never existed in the world before, and I'm not sure where else to do it, Mr Harper. I'll call down. She joined about two months before I did. Uh, it was around about Christmas time, because you were only allowed to stay for three months in case you went mad. I think it was a doctor friend of one of the engineers who said they could cause psychological problems being exposed to all these strange noises. I told him not to bother today. Oh, help me with the screen, would you, please? Lovely. Oh, ignore him. I set up the mic, would you, Tilia? Yeah, just about here. Uh -huh. I was doing this yesterday. After trying a couple of different methods, it's by far the best sound for what we needed. Yep, Michael, the producer, kept laughing at me. In the end, I said, if I spot you laughing at me one more time, I'm going home. And he did, so I left. Quite right. Shall I? Mm. Beautiful. Well, it's music, isn't it? Oh, Why? It's forbidden. It's a word. What word? It's the M word. So, what are you supposed to be making in here, though? Special sounds. Oh, gosh. As we're seeing it by some of the music department, as charlatans using sound technology to disguise our lack of musical ability. Oh, I see. So, the uh, musical integrity of the nation is at stake. So, if you're not musicians, what are you being asked to call yourself? Sound assistants. Studio technicians. If a sound isn't notable, then it's not music, that's the thinking. But it's the abstract sound that's organised, therefore it's music, isn't it? Abstract music? We have also sound houses where we practice and demonstrate all sounds in their generation. We have harmonies which you have not. Of quarter sounds and lesser slides of sounds. Hello? Brian, remember me? Yes, of course, Delia. Delia, uh, yes. yes. Uh, of course I remember the induction <laughs> wake. <Yes. laughs> Sorry, I was ice and graced. Have you been posted here, as it were? Well, yeah, uh, long story, but yes, uh, yes, in a way. This is extraordinary, isn't it? 
It's 1620, and he's talking about reverberation and delays. Look, artificial echoes reflecting the voice many times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it's incredible, yes. So, look, sounds in trunks and pipes. Sounds like microphone leads, don't you think? Mm. In strange lines and distances. Well, that could be broadcasting. It's Francis Bacon's vision for a utopian society called Neo Atlantis. Apparently, Daphne Oren put this up the day the workshop opened in 1958. She said that Bacon's premonition had inspired her to persuade the BBC they needed to create a space to experiment with sound. Of course, if we were in France or Germany... Oh, they'd they given up an entire department yeah. to it, yes. It's curious, isn't yeah. it, how um, terrified people are of this place? Like, it, it might be the root of some hideous continental sound invasion. <laughs> Do we have to whisper? Well, possibly, yes. They don't want composers making... In here, apparently. Look, mm. look. This is a magnificent. You know, look. It's the Crystal Palace. <laughs> oh, look, and this 1887 harmonium with mouse proof pedals. See, look, mouse proof. <laughs> <laughs> Super. It's a good job as they're played with mice in here, I believe. But do you think they can read? Well, some of them, but they're usually the ones that cause the most trouble, aren't they? <laughs> At least in my experience. <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry, oh. sorry. Oh, Christ, golly. what the blazes, uh, um, Desmond? Oh. So sorry. This is um, Brian. Hello. Yes, I was going to introduce myself, Brian. Well, you've certainly made an impression already. Where's your tie, man? Well, I prefer to wear a cravat. Hodgson, isn't it? Yes, that's right, sir. Yes, well, I've uh, heard all about you from Bumps. Well, if you want to secure your reputation as a snappy dresser, Brian, perhaps you should concentrate on your professional reputation first. <laughs> Uh, so, yes, sorry. Sorry. Should we help you? Oops. Here we go. <laughs> when I first came here, I was expecting to find beautiful chromium faced equipment and everybody wearing white coats. And in fact, I found the tattiest studio, all full of virtually redundant antique equipment. Interesting stuff. Well, potentially, but it's full of mistakes. Do you see? No. Well, they've not allowed for the Pythagorean comma, so all these scales are wrong. Oh, okay. Um, it's the reason why a, a Pythagorean 12-pointed star will never close on one side, because there ought to be a discrepancy between the 12 justly tuned perfect fits. Oh. Would you mind if I corrected it? Oh, well, as I've never seen anyone so much as look at it, you do what you need to. Well, they really ought to. It's a beautiful progression. But then I suppose if you're using two-dimensional models to explain four-dimensional concepts, you will end up with weird harmonics eventually. Well, you can be our very own enchantress of numbers. I'm a mathematician, Desmond. Right. I think I've always been um, a very independent thinker. But um, I must say that I, I, I go back to first principles when it comes to, uh, to music. I go back to the Greeks and the original, um, well, the simple harmonic series. Uh, I think that's a very healthy thing to do for anyone. <laughs> It is 0830 hours, September the 14th, 1988. These are children of our time. They should live to be a hundred. They may colonize the stars. They will not toil. They need never be unhappy. But this morning, as every morning, there is a problem. How to spend a golden lifetime? What to do with so much time? From this September morning in 1988, look back across a quarter of a century. It really meant the use of computers rather than the human brain for the control of processes and systems. The new cybernetic machines go one step further. In fact, they simulate the human brain. That's what the word cybernation means. Cybernetic machines. 
So, how's uh, 1988 sounding? Like a very bad dream. We also have uh, a new commission. Mm. So, Structure Sonore from Paris. Well, Verity Lambert can't afford them, but she would like us to sound like them. They have glass rods set in steel, a massive grant from their government, and a 20-paid ensemble of musicians. Mm. There are five of us being paid peanuts. We use square and sine wave generators and are mostly interested in dissecting white noise. Mm. She would like it to sound familiar, but different. Yes, we've been given a, a scrap of manuscript from the composer, Ron Grainer, with a few bars scribbled on there with a melody and a bass line. Yes. And a mood description of wind bubbles and clouds. Yes. Interesting. It's for a drama about a time-travelling doctor. But, of course, they're doing it on the cheap and, uh, not very surprisingly, that's where we come in. They want us to prove we are as capable of tunefulness as uncanniness. Christ. Oof. And, as you all know, we are inundated at the moment. Does anyone in this room have any idea how to do this? Oh. Well... Hmm? Yes? How? Uh. Yeah. <sighs> Listen to this. Something like that. That's what he's written. I think we can do something with that. This is very impressive. No, I think most of what I've ever needed to know about anything at all has come from that book. Yeah. That's quite a claim. Mm. I'm translating notes on the page into cycles per second, and then I'm going to translate the duration of notes into inches of tape. That's fine. I'll grab this and this. I wonder why you were so engrossed in the BBC Tennis Club newsletters. Was I? You are aware that these are the as-yet undistributed June editions and that Madalena is the club chair. It's a good job she likes me, then. Well, not anymore, love. No, 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 that is naughty. Don't tell her. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> Run wrote the score with sort of abstract things on, like wind clouds and sweeps and swoops and wind bubble, all sort of beautiful descriptions, but with a carefully worked out rhythm. And so I got to work and put it all together. So, are we all set? Yes, I'm just about there. Okay. So bass, bass, melody, details. You're on bass. I'll do melody and details, okay? This will work. Three, two, one. <laughs> He had this sort of a, <laughs> almost permanent state of sniffles. This old man said, you've got a very bad cold, my dear. And she said, no, no, I've got vasomotoronitis. And he said, you should try some of this. And he gave her a pinch of smile. <coughs> and which immediately cleared her head. Of course, no, she didn't realise that point. It's like one of the most addictive substances you never let go up your nose. Um, and that became a recurrent habit. Knock, knock. Who's there? Doctor. Doctor who? 
airs tomorrow between Grandstand and Jukebox Jewelry. <laughs> That's still not a punchline. <laughs> <sighs> Hello, Leonard. Hello, yes. Yes, OK, you can go ahead, then. Right ho. Well, as long as you realise all I've got in front of me is a pile of tape, which I'm just ripping off the printer, which you can probably hear in the background now. Hello, London, this is Leonard Parkin calling Radio Newsreel from Washington. President Kennedy and Governor John Colony of Texas were shot today from an ambush as President Kennedy's motorcade left the centre of Dallas where the president went on a speech. Verity's new sound is way out. Uh, Verity Lambert walked into the workshop and said, I want a new sound that is way out and catchy. Mm. A version of events. Uh, Mr. Briscoe and his team uh, looked over the notes and went to work without using a single musician or musical instrument. Uh, they did it all with electronics. And uh, this is the first time that electronics has been used to produce a recognisable tune. It sounds as if they think the tune's been manifested by some kind of radiophonic alien. Yeah. You know, Ron was so sweet, he said to me, oh, you should be getting half of my royalties. We can't claim individual authorship, can we? We're just seen as technicians. Mm. Do your job and know your place, my dear. It's bloody appalling. I feel like I'm traversing time. Tapping into frequencies as I'm making sound from fragments of Delia's life. From her music and her voice, her words. In many ways, our lives are a reflection of each other's. Our determination to be heard and our seeking the unheard. Our vision of sound as an image or a feeling. And the excitement of discovery and redrawing rules. When I was doing the inventions with Barry Bermage, he wanted sounds which would sound like a gothic older piece. He said, well, give me a pencil and paper, I did. And with great care and elaboration, he drew me a beautiful gothic older piece and said, that's the sort of sound I want. The afterlife, an invention for radio, all the voices were recorded from life and arranged in a setting of pure electronic sound in five moments. Light. 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 Everywhere is light. 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 The vastness of space. Space. It's so clear, clear, clear. Green fields, valleys, clear running water. So clear, clear, clear. My most beautiful sound at that time was made by a tatty old BBC lampshade I found lying around the studio, but it had the most beautiful ringing sound to it. Like joining forces, an exchange between us. This was a documentary programme about the Tuareg tribe. The Tuareg tribe are nomads in the Sahara Desert. I tried to convey the distance of the horizon and the heat haze.
there's this very high, slow, reedy sound that indicates like the strand of camels seen at a distance wandering across the desert. That, in fact, was made from square waves put through every filter I could possibly find to take out all the bass frequencies. For the castrated oboe. So the camels rode off into the sunset with my voice in their hooves and green lampshades on their backs. It has to be something out of this world. Most of the, the programs that I did were either in the far distant future the far distant past or in the mind. I think this was a science fiction play called The Prophet. It ended up with all these robots and they sang a, a song of praise to uh, this play, presumably The Prophet. And this was the song they sang. It is difficult to pronounce because it's made from backwards chanting. I think if you play it forwards, it would say something like, Praise to the master, master his, his wisdom, wisdom and his reason. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Praise to the master, his wisdom and his reason. Ooh, ooh. Ooh, it's, golly, it's a bit. Could you? No. I did train as an actor, I know what I'm doing. Yes, I know, so you keep telling me. Let's move on. Now, there is a God, there must be a God. Yes, no, you certainly didn't, did you? You're so mean. Have a go at that yeah. one. There is a God, there must be a God. There must be a God, there is a God. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Great. Mm. Hmm. Okay. And now we're going to. Rewind. Didn't you have a deadline tomorrow morning? No, my deadlines are always tomorrow morning. And the closer they get, the more I find better things to do. I think I suffer from a kind of um, reverse adrenaline. But we're not flying our own kites, are we, darling? We spring into action for whatever department needs a tune. Mm. Let's get a drink. Another one. Well, as far as I remember, it was like this. I had a, a very complicated studio and definitely wanted to make the studio better. And at this time, I'd heard of, I'd heard of the Radiophonic Workshop, but I'd never been there. And then one day, Brian and Delia came to see me. I think they just knocked on the door at Putney, said, what about... Um, joining forces and making commercial music to make money. And I thought this was, this was rather amazing that the Radiophonic Workshop should come to me. I hadn't at that stage realised that what they were proposing was not part of the Radiophonic Workshop, but something different. Peter had met Delia and uh, 
she involved me and uh, that's when we started Unit Delta Plus. He was very naturally, as everybody was impressed by her. Well, it gives you know, a whole range of facilities that weren't available to us and the studio to work in where we could sort of not feel entrapped. Peter Zinoviev was doing the most interesting things. He didn't claim to be a musician, he didn't claim to be a composer, but imagine one of those beautiful London townhouses. The drawing room on the first floor was totally crammed with telephone relay equipment where he was working on his random sequences and I thought, golly, this is the way things should go. That was a beautifully interesting time. Everything was mechanical. It was all part of a very fertile sort of area. A wonderful sort of creative time. Things were happening all over London. Units were, you know, it was a popular thing. And then the Delta was for Delia, really. <laughs> and plus Peter and me. So we gave this concert. And um, I don't know how it came to be in Newbury. Yes, Peter knew the people who had the theatre. And I think it was P Peter's idea to do it. I suppose he must have asked us. Somebody must have asked us. And it wasn't a, it wasn't much of an affair. It was a country, you know, village thing. Well, there was light projection being done by the Hornsey College of Art. I think my forte is well, apart from having an analytical mind to do electronic sound. Uh, at the opposite end, I'm very good at writing extended melody, for which there was not really an opening at the BBC. And so I met this guy. I was giving a lecture at Morley College in London, and he came up to me afterwards, and he played the double bass, same as I did. And he was already doing tracks for the, the Ballet Rambert. And so we got together, and we started this album. We got together. I was doing a postgrad degree in the physics of electronics. We had this, this lecture on electronic music in the next hall, given by some people from the Radiophonic Workshop, Brian, Delia, and Peter Zinovio, who call themselves Unit Delta Plus. But I thought, Christ, uh, yes, absolutely, I want to see this. So I, shot along to this thing, <clears throat> and sure enough, these people were actually doing what to me had just been a fantasy. Also, I think there's some chemistry between Delia and I, and we sort of hit it off. Yes, David sort of erupted out of the audience at the end of the, uh, the lecture. Um, complete bearded hippie, uh, a bit like an excitable Peter Pan, really. And uh, I know it made me say <laughs> he still is. You know, Delta Plus, I remember you guys, you were playing last week at the Roundhouse. And we got talking after we just got on like a house on fire. And within a week, we'd started Kaleidophon. Is this OK? Yes, you know, I'm, I'm here this time most nights. No one comes in. Night Porter thinks I'm a very strange beast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. Where's the uh, frequency shifter? Frequency shifter? Uh, it's there. There. Yeah. There. Oh, yes. <laughs> OK, yep. Well, let's... We can start there, can't we? Um, Fantastic. So with that. Uh-huh. How That's many have you got? 12, James. 12? Yeah. Frequency <laughs> shifter, and then we have the... Um, Incredible. These. And the Phillips is, of course. OK. Them. OK. Well, we might as well get going, right? Right. OK. Is that linked up to there? Because I can't oh, see... Yes, the, yeah, no, of course. Of course it is. Fantastic. All right. 
looking straight away. No, 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 no. This is what I was talking about before. You, you, you. Okay. All right. No, I, I do know. I've okay. used it. Yeah. Yeah. I use it every day. So, psychedelia. Who are you? Hmm. Well. What you doing? Hmm. Hey. Golly. Okay. Um. Oh, God, where to start? Okay. Um. No, no. Um. No, I can't. Please. Please. Okay. Music. No, I'm not doing this. Mm. No. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I studied um, music and mathematics at Cambridge. Mm. See, I'm, see I'm, um, I'm fascinated by harmonics and the numbers that are, are built into nature. Clouds, mountains, and coastlines, and ferns, and natural fractals. And of course, our bodies respond to those numbers, even at um, a subconscious level. And electronic music, well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I suppose I, I was three years old during the Coventry Blitz, and I can still hear the sound of the, the air raid sirens, a sort of permanent background hum. And there was silence, followed by the sound of the all clear. And I can remember my mother counting in the gaps between the bombs falling. I'm oh, sorry, is this really boring? No. No, I, I, I'm closing my eyes so I can hear you properly. Hmm. Yes, yes, I do that sometimes. <laughs> and I am very, very stoned. <laughs> Go on. Go on and on and on. It's, it's, it's nice. No, it's not nice. It's not nice at all, David. Go on, you were talking about your mother, please. Yes, yeah. Um, well, she didn't pray, which was strange, because she was a devout Catholic. She counted. And I think there was something very, very potent within those spaces, a sort of lifetime of faith for my mother. And as a child, you don't know what that is, of course. And I think those experiences, they must live in every cell of your body. Oh, I don't know. It's just silly theory. just not as conventional vocals. What do you mean? So, if, um, if somebody, maybe, in the background was having an orgasm... Right? Yeah. <laughs> then we should use it as one of the waveforms. And then the listener will never know what they're hearing. <laughs> I mean, it's marvellous, but yes, they've turned it down. <sighs> no, what was the problem this time? Well, you're not here most days, are you? 
I'm here every day. I work through the night. What's that got to do with them? Well, I can only assume you have other priorities. No, I've always yeah. preferred to work at night. You know that. You've seen how I work. Not recently, no. It's too crowded in here, Desmond, during the day. There's, there's too much work and there's no space to work in. Yes, well, well according to this, it's, uh, it's unforeseen circumstances that have prevented them from using the piece. Desmond, they asked for light-hearted, cartoon-like music for a calm maintenance programme, not the national bloody anthem. <laughs> Are we, uh, are we wizards? Um... Electronic wizards. You know, sound, sound wizards. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and, and this, this sound here, right, Delia, it, um, it put me in mind of, like, uh, an electronic blizzard. Oh, what, like a, a wizard in a blizzard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why? Why not? Blizzard in a blizzard. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Why? Why not? You, I mean, you might, you might laugh, but but listen. With uh, this album, could be a sonic rites of passage for the future generations. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I, I, I don't. One loop. <laughs> <laughs> Just think of it. It's a romantic triangle, okay? Because there's there's us in one corner, there's the music in the other, and up here, <gasps> all right, is the future <laughs> listeners who we're giving birth to in this room right here together. It's it's pure electronic sex. <laughs> oh yes. I love I love triangles. Do you love triangles like that? Mm. Yeah. Mm. And all their associated forms. Tripods, pyramids, cones. And prisms. Yeah, cones. 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 Yeah. Cones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Aren't we? Brian. It's a triangle, isn't it? It's a romantic triangle, Brian. Brian. Hmm. Exploded my Daleks. Good. Uh, where are you off to in such a hurry, Delilah? Brian Jones. Brian Jones is here. I love him. What, Brian Rolling Stones, Jones. I love no, him. No, no, look. I've got him now. You can have him later. Go and explode your Dalek. Brian Jones. Goodness me. There we were with our 12 oscillators, hand tuned oscillators, and, and eight gating circuits. And he sort of went to it with his, oh, I remember him so vividly, with his frilly cuffs and things. And he, he went to it as though he could play it as a musical instrument. <laughs> the rubbish. I think he was too spaced out. I didn't want to go back to cutting up tape because I was so against tape machines. I was incredibly romantic. And Brian and Delia were very practical. Um, they really weren't interested in the fact that in the future, wonderful, exotic things could be done by computers. They were interested in what could be done today. The next item, Partita for Unattended Computer by Peter Zinoviev, is a true live performance in the sense that no magnetic tape is being used at all. Furthermore, the computer has a choice at various stages in the procedure, and the piece therefore comes out different every time it's played. The performance you're about to hear is therefore unique and unrepeatable. First of all, checks are made. Right from the beginning, it never really clicked. I don't think we quarreled, but just nothing happened. It didn't work out with Peter. Mm. I think he's... 
accepted that we're all pulling in different directions now. I hope so. I think he's a genius. I just can't work that way. What do you think of his idea for an unattended computer? Well, it's very difficult to say. I think it's thrilling as a concept, but are the sounds interesting enough? He's a visionary. A futurist. Just um, yeah, a little thing. I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I've just been I've just been working on it. It's a, a sort of like a, an electric bass, uh, but it's got a, a electro conductive tape here. Yeah, I'm not sure yet. I don't know. It's um, I don't know. Could be good. Yeah, that's interesting. Could be good. Yeah, could be. Good. Yeah. Hmm. Good news. I've got good news. Very good news. Uh, sit down. Sit down. Oh, just tell us, will you? I can't bear it. I took some of the stuff we've been working on to my friend Chris at Island Records. Mm. And he absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. Loved it. Great. And um, he said, what do you want? And I said, well, I don't, we're quite allowed to do a single. And then he said, uh, David, how much do you think a single makes? And I said, I don't know, Chris, I've really no idea. He stopped me there. And then, then he said £3,000. And so there oh. and then, he wrote me a cheque no. for three thousand pounds no. said here's your single now go make an album no yeah oh that's marvelous yeah marvelous. yeah well done oh, well that done let's see it come on well done where is it but I'm just as high in a rut looking up as I was in a cloud looking down. Da dum dum fire bird, etc. Um, oh, yes, Brian arranged that. I'm a meeting with Chris Blackwell. I think David had some contacts at Island Records. I, I spent as much time as I could in the studio there, which was on the top floor. The living accommodation was quite horrendous. By then, Delia was getting into sort of hippiedom. The ceiling had a parachute draped from it, and she had a cat, it had fleas always. Uh, so we uh, got our numbers together. <coughs> all right, all right, all right, listen, listen, you get... Think, think about it, Jen, right? Your boyfriend, he's just, he's just crashed, his car. So you're running away in the woods, somewhere off the A1. Through a lay-by, you're wearing hardly any clothes. Brutal rain, it's crashing down. This is horrific. So, so give me some more, okay? Give me more. <coughs> more. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> yes. <coughs> yes. <coughs> the rain is coming. <coughs> Blood and piss and rain. <coughs> Yes. Is that sort of thing? That's incredible. Right. Hey. Hi, darling. Hey. <laughs> right. We sort of did a piece of the ballet rumba, and a couple of actresses from the Royal Shakespeare Company came over to um, to record their voices. And I remember we were, we'd recorded them telling st stories of um, new experiences and stuff like that. And then um, just the sounds of laughing, crying, screaming, um, whispering, uh, just about every emotion you could think of. And we were mixing these things um, later after they'd, everyone had left. And, um, oh yeah, there was this banging at the door, really violent, um, and opened the door. P police came in, pushed me aside, searched the place. When they found there wasn't anybody there, they stopped and told me what it was about. They said there'd been a complaint that somebody had heard a girl being hysterically raped in my room. So this is what mixing tapes in the night is. The next day, the guy underneath us dies. And less than a week later, the guy next door dies. And one of them was 98, the other had cancer, but that didn't stop 
the people around saying it's these new electronic sounds that have done them in. And, and we were like uh, Frankensteins and the, the villagers had come with their pitchforks, you know, and we were evicted from that place so damn fast. your journey? Oh, magnificent. I took the 38 bus from Summerstown. It was terribly easy. Oh, Ada will be here soon. I, I just, I, I don't know where to begin. You must have a clear idea of where you want to end up. Otherwise, you'll just be blown about by every momentary gust of feeling. You must stand firm, my dear, and accept that people will not like it. Let's have a drink. All the civilised women of the present century are anxious only to inspire love when they ought to have the nobler aim of getting respect for their abilities and virtues. Oh, Ada. Ada, hello. Please come in. Thank you for coming. Mary's been helping me come to terms with the broken heart. I need to clarify my own wave patterns and, and clear them of all irrelevances. If anything is blocking that process, your natural resonances will be stifled. Firstly, you must not wish to have power over men, but power over yourself. Is that fair, Ada? Yes, and perhaps not always happy, perhaps, and not always fulfilled. But at one with myself. Yes, you need to find friends in women and fellows in men. Yes. I'll drink to that. Your best and wisest refuge from all troubles is in your science, Delia. Yes. 
essential truth and beauty through music. Let the pattern of mathematics be my roadmap to fulfilment. And love, by its very nature, must be transitory. So, to friendship. To friendship. To friendship. It is raining women's voices as if they were dead. Um, sorry, sorry, it's just a little too posh. Uh, yes, that makes sense. Do you want me to do it again? Yeah. It is raining women... Oh, hell, that's not it at all. No. It is raining women's voices as if... Oh, no. Can we just do the whole thing again? There should be two of these. I left... Did you take the other one? Okay, that's enough. Come on out. Everybody out. Everybody out. We're overheating. Of course we are, because we're sealed in here like a tin shepherd's pie. Right, going out. I can't stand the sight of Jasmine today. The inner depressions grow out of pressure. I mean, a depression is basically when you back off from life, you depress yourself away from it. And I think that's how it all started. Everything was expected of Delia. She was the you know, the clever girl at school. She was, she shone in everything she did. She also, we must remember, she was a mathematician. And very often, mathematicians burn out quite a on a knife. And I think the circumstances around her private life were getting a bit complex. I remember at one point, Ron Grainer saying to Adelia, you drink too much. And she said, no, I don't. It was self-medication to keep her calm, I think. And the trouble with any sort of medication, it goes on and on and on. I mean, it was starting in the 70s, you know, the late 60s and 70s. And uh, went on really for the rest of her life. She was not a conformist in any way. I did rebel against a, a lot of, um, <laughs> yes, yes, I, I did. I, I did all sorts of things I was told I couldn't do. Peter says it's not ready for commercial use yet. It may never be. Uh, they just want to see how we get on with it. Uh, but the uh, filters and oscillators are much more stable than the VCS-3. It's based around a combination of three VCS-3 systems combined into one massive synthesizer. Mm. Well, you know, I, I'm sorry, Desmond, but it's hopeless. Well, I... mm. Listen, I mean, these sounds have nothing to them. I think we, just need, we need to give a little bit more time to see how you can help us. Well, it's much faster. Certainly won't help me. Uh, nice. It was called the Delaware, or what they wanted it called the Delaware, it was. So it wasn't even a Cinti 100 then. We only made about 30, 35 or something. But they're marvellous machines. I was really looking forward to having synthesizers because I knew it would speed up the work so much. I was looking forward to being able to do things much more quickly. But I think I'm still disappointed with synthesizers and what one can do with them, with the flexibility of them. I think the trouble was she was too in advance of her time. Really, if you look back on it, we thought, thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. But it was a very primitive machine. I'd still like to get inside them somewhere and make it do a more human sound than what it does. We have a new commission uh, from the Institute of Electrical Engineers. Uh, we are going to do a radiophonic workshop in concert. We can really show off our Synthi 100 here, so let's wow them. Hmm? Uh, remember, audience-wise, while there'll be a natural interest in music, electronics and the arts, the social nature of the event and the presence of the ladies will require that the programme is not too technical, but entertaining and aesthetically pleasing. So, Delia. What are you doing? Decomposing. Hmm. It's a nightmare. There's a deadline looming, and we haven't heard anything from you yet. Right. <clears throat> Pants 
Gladstone congratulates Edison. Morse code and a space rocket taking on. Use the scaffolding. Fit it where it fits. And it was a big official number which was being performed in front of the Queen at the Festival Hall. And she'd been commissioned to do a short piece using the Delaware synthesizer, um, which was by then, you know, that was the bee's knees of modern equipment. I began by interpreting the actual letters, IEE -E 100, in two different ways. The first one in a Morse code version, using the Morse for IEE -E 100. This I found extremely dull rhythmically. I most definitely suffered from what I call reverse adrenaline. Reverse adrenaline. When a project deadline got closer, my output slowed down enormously, and there were just other things to do. But I went to the event. I did my bit. Though I was furious with Brian at the time. I think it went well. The Queen liked it, apparently. Well, I'm not even sure she stayed till the end. I certainly didn't. I've tried to get into it a feeling of simplicity and loneliness of a man on a moon. Play it to them and then we'll see. The program's going into colour now. There's a new doctor. So? It's my job to make sure that we stay afloat under this particular regime. <laughs>
Can you hear what I hear? <laughs> Partly why she left the BBC was there was a lot of pressure of, on her and at the same time no recognition. I think I met Lydia in 72. I got on quite well with her. We looked at Circle of Lights and listened to the soundtrack and I was very impressed. I said, okay, I like to maybe work with her. So we went to a pub. We asked her to collaborate on our first film, One of These Days, which I made with uh, Elsa Stansfield. She was telling, you know, that she was really fed up with this BBC and wanted to do her own things and, uh, and very uh, curious to, to hear about the film and what we wanted to do, if she could come to the Netherlands and so like that. She felt no restrictions and I think that that appealed very much to her. She was totally free. I just had to flee. To me, everything was out of tune in the world. So I thought I'd go as far north in, in England as I can. So I went there, I had a lovely house, built from stones from Hadrian's Wall, yeah. <laughs> crazy, crazy, crazy. London needs you, Delilah, darling. I've set up my studio permanently now at 8, 9 and 10 Studios, Neil's Yard, Covent Garden. I've called it Electrophon. Perhaps I could lure you back. With love from B. Please get in touch. I miss you. I was in a disused quarry. And so they advertised for a French-speaking radio operator. As soon as I saw the word radio, I applied. Bonjour. Delia went to work originally on the gas pipeline that was being laid across Cumbria. It was all around sound and language. She was a French speaker and would have been bilingual. She told me that she'd met her husband when he was laying at the gas pipelines. We kept in touch after Delia left. Uh, for Cumbria and went to uh, marry a local man there in Gilsland. It looked like they, they had nothing in common apart from the drinking. There wasn't much else. They were so different. And I think in a little village like she was, people thought she was some kind of screwball, really. Delia broke up with her husband, it was inevitable, it was always going to happen. And she went to the LYC and got some work there. It was an incredible place. She moved into an environment which was much more her, because it was artists and stimulation and things to do. I think Delia is one of those people that I met in life, a bit like a meteor really. There was this incredible flash this woman who did all these things and then just went. But I won't ever forget her. I lived and worked with one of the first group of Chinese abstract artists, Li Wan Chia, at his art gallery and museum by Hadrian's Wall. Well, Li was a, a very hard-working man and not really a people person, you know, kind of shy in that way. And his uh, LYC was really his artwork. The museum was his artwork, like a social sculpture. And it was also kind of a space where you could uh, drink tea in a library and uh, where children could play. So it was a very open uh, space with rather good exhibitions. But I met also um, Winifred Nicholson through him. Lee got, uh, got that first building Partly through Winifred. Did you really convert this place single handedly? No. All the help I need comes from the birds and my good friend Winifred Nickerson. Let's play a game. We each write in only two words the absolute essence of something. 
or nothing. Like your cosmic point? Yes. Then we throw the paper and pass to the next person. And am I right in saying that the cosmic point is not an object, but a proposition about space and time? <laughs> okay, so shall I read them out? I've done two because I couldn't decide. Yes. A dot, a prism, an octave. <laughs> a concrete poem. Do you think perhaps we've written the same thing? I condemn all contraception. Euro pollution control has failed to neutralize it. Cozy, let me read it to you. It's quite funny. Delia Derbyshire, who battled depression. Did I? Golly, maybe I did. Died aged only 64 in 2001. Yes, that, that was a shame. She was the godmother of electronic dance music. No idea about any of that. Sounds good, doesn't it? A hopeless alcoholic. Actually, I was rather a successful alcoholic. Who writes this stuff, really, honestly? She carried out pioneering work for the BBC Radiophonic Workshop in the early 1960s, producing the familiar Doctor Who signature theme. Will they ever stop going on about that? <laughs> I very much doubt it. And collaborating with Brian Jones and Jimi Hendrix and others. Hardly I glimpsed Jimi once and had a chat with Brian. Oh, I loved him and his frilly cuffs, but who didn't? Miss Derbyshire was also a woman of her times, clad in Bieber, never, and Mary Quant, what are my wages? Her hair in a Vidal Sassoon bob, wrong. Too busy for hairstyles. A fixture of parties of swinging London, blah, 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 blah. Here we go. Now, this is why I'm here, you see. She left the BBC a disillusioned woman. No, I didn't. She struggled with drink. It was never a struggle, always a pleasure. Had a series of unsuitable jobs. I had some lovely ones, as a matter of fact. At one time, she married an out-of-work miner. It was a blip, and he wasn't a miner but settled in the Midlands where she lived in relative obscurity and would rail between drinks. <laughs> Strong! Golly, am I glad I came back. Otherwise, who designs the myths?
Egypt, reel three, band one, closing. <laughs> <laughs> 